Okay, well, we can make a start. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, we're excited uh, about our event uh, today. This year, it's the first one in 2021. It's the virtual series, Let's Stay Toxic. And the topic of today is the question of what is needed to accelerate change. My name is Maika. I'm the founder of Ocean Now. I'm your host tonight. The co-host will be Cheryl from the Ocean Now team. And we have a couple Hi. of more people on board um, from the Ocean Now team as well, Sam and Ola, who will also be helping out. Um, so what we have on the agenda for tonight is we will look at um, what is actually needed to accelerate change in our society. In this context, we will be looking at the main focus of making change and on a political level, but also a little bit on the consumer level. And it will be national and international. So it's going to be a mix. And the actual frame of making change where and how is actually also really wide. Yeah. So we want to look at a, living a more sustainable life. Like how can we actually contribute to this? And so I will shortly introduce you to our three panelists tonight. And what we'll then uh, do before we actually get into the discussion is have a little poll with all of you uh, with a few questions, going to be pretty brief. Um, and then also uh, the Q&A, just one note on the Q&A. We always mention this at the beginning because it's relevant for later, but you might already have one or two questions um, up front or during the meeting, uh, the session. Uh, this is for Cheryl. Yeah, exactly. So we are going to have a Q&A so you can ask your questions in the end of our session. And it's going to work like this. So on the bottom of the Zoom call, you can see that there is a chat button and you can click on that and then you can paste your question in, in, in there. But before you send it away, you have to click on my name. My name is Cheryl. So this question goes directly to me and at the end, I will just group those questions together for the QA and we can ask them together, our panelists, and uh, see and uh, look forward for their answers. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Great. So I'd like to introduce you to our panelists Justine Mayo, Zero Waste Europe and Rethink Plastic Alliance. She is a consumption and uh, production campaigner and policy coordinator. Uh, Justine has an educational background in international European and environmental law. Uh, she worked at the EU unit of Greenpeace for four years on EU ocean and fisheries policy. After an 18 month break, uh, traveling and uh, getting involved in different small local projects, she joined the Surfrider Foundation where she mainly worked on plastic pollution and contributed to the work um, of the Rethink Plastic Alliance. Besides her work on plastics for the Rethink Plastic Alliance, she leads the team at Zero Waste Europe on consumption and production in the area on food uh, contact materials, um, particularly the health impacts from single use packaging. Welcome on board, Justine, nice to have you. Second uh, guest and panelist is Hélène Dugui. Uh, she's a chemical lawyer at Client Earth. Um, before joining Client Earth's chemicals team in 2020, um, Hélène has gained significant experience in environment public policy in the context of NGOs, for example, the French NGO uh, Notre Affaire à Tous, and public institutions as the European Commission or UNEP uh, WCMC as well as in the private sector, advising companies on environmental legal matters. Her areas of expertise include international and EU law, with a specific focus on environmental legal issues and human rights. Welcome on board, Hélène. Nice to have you. Our third panelist is Klaus, Klaus Mindrup. Klaus is a member of the German Parliament in Berlin um, and member of SPD and is involved in an interface for sustainability that is ecology and um, social issues. He holds a degree in biology and before becoming a member of Bundestag, he was the deputy chairman of UFUEV, which is an independent institute for the environment. And he was a member of the federal board of BWE, which is a German Wind Energy Association. 
environmental climate protection and tenant protection are the focal points of his political work. Great, you can join tonight, Klaus. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Really good to see everyone. We want to address the question of how to make change or how to accelerate change. And we want to talk about it on a personal, but also on a professional level. So it's, of course, going to be a mix. We're going to look at the stories, like also of our panelists and their personal experiences. Um, but also we want to like have an interactive meeting as well, um, or interactive session, and also involve you and your personal view on things on how to make actually change. And sometimes we don't even, we don't really have the feeling that we can have impact. So we're really, really curious about getting your input as well. That's why we'll also start with a poll um, shortly. So what this poll will be, it's going to be um, six questions. You can answer them really with it by with your gut. Like, don't think too much, just go with what you feel like. And what, how we're going to do it is that we'll read out the questions and you have 10 seconds to answer one question. At the end, we will show the results. Um, so the overview of like where people stand. Okay, we could make a start now. Would you, so I can I can go ahead with the questions maybe, or would you like to read them, Cheryl? You can I can read them out loud. So okay. the first question would be, have you ever contacted a politician? You mean so contact it in a way that you okay. like it's a message or a call um so it does petition doesn't count we get to petition later but have you ever called or sent an email sent a, like a social media message exactly so uh, i guess most of you have uh, answered the first question so i go on with the second question which would be do you know how to approach a politician so if you would have a question or anything else you'd like to talk about, would you know how to approach a politician or not? The third question would be, do you think there's any benefit to contacting a politician? So do you think it makes a difference if you, t uh, if you contact any politician or do you think, nah, it doesn't really make sense? Okay. And our fourth question is going to be on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your ability to influence politicians with one being low and five being high? Okay, and the, the last question we have right now is, have you ever joined a demonstration or an online action, maybe a petition? Okay. okay, there are still some people who have to choose their answer. That's what I can see. I guess we are, we're done yet, I would say. Okay, yeah, so what we can do now is um, end the poll then and uh, show the results. Um, yeah, so I give, I show the results now to everyone and I hope this, sh this is showing. Yeah, okay, great. So for question one, we have, have you ever contacted a politician? 70% say yes. This is very good. This is very, like we have a very, inter like an active crowd. Um, we have number two, do you know how to approach a politician? Then 67, also 70% do know how to. Um, number three is, do you think there's any benefit to contacting a politician? And 78% also say yes. Number four is, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your ability to influence politicians, with one being low and five being high? And we have the majority in one being low at 36% and two being relatively low at 36%. The medium part, which is three, is 22% and high is like very low. So um, we can see that, yeah, inf the influ influencing part is a little uh, shaky. We have question number five, have you ever joined a demonstration on online action? 97%, uh, 97, yeah. 
which is really, of course, very strong. So I'm really glad to hear we've got a very engaged um, audience here. This is really good to see. And um, so with these results, we could start the talk. Um, so I would like to ask our panelists to possibly just in one or two sentences just to kind of comment so how how do you see of course we we clearly have a quite engaged audience is there anything that um that you find interesting here like a pattern um something that stands out um because maybe there's one or two results that are maybe standing out that you would like to comment on and uh, whoever would like to start, uh, Klaus, Justine and Elen, this is a question for all of you, whoever would like to comment. I'm wondering of the figure of 31 percent people never contacted a politician. This is really, I think it's a, it's a problem. Normally, we have politicians on the municipality level and in, in Germany on the federal state level, the Bundestag and European Parliament and uh, uh, don't have a contact uh, with them, uh, even not in school or uh, later if you've got a problem in your neighborhood. I think this, this figure is, 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 is high. And uh, so um, in the election, you have election campaigns. I think it's it's not so, posi not so positive <laughs> from mm -hmm. my perspective. But uh, uh, the, uh, the third question, this is very po uh, positive. Between, uh, 78% uh, who see uh, benefit in contacting a politician is really good. Yeah. So mm -hmm. one, one good answer, one, okay, one problematic from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, mm -hmm. um, I find this very interesting. And I mean, I've, I've answered as far as I'm concerned um, with regard to my organization experience, I think I would be more afraid uh, to contact or you know approach a politician on a personal level. I think it's always easier when you're an organization because you feel you're more legitimate to do so. Um, but I feel the results of the poll really show a paradox between you know um, citizens trying to influence um, the decision making process through the normal path, which is the policymakers, but being quite disappointed about it because they have the impression they can't influence anything. So, you know, they go demonstrating because it's, it's more it's more powerful, perhaps, uh, on a personal level. So uh, mm -hmm. for me, it's a bit sad because I feel there is a perhaps the, the paradox of uh, of our context today where it's very different, di difficult to influence the, the policy policy making process, unfortunately. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you so much, Elen. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, this paradox and uh, the fact that there are so many stakeholders in this world. And um, yeah, so getting to the critical mass yeah, of making change is, is really a, a topic. Anything you would like to add, Justine? Um, yeah, I mean, on this, I think um, I, I would agree <laughs> the, the processes are complex and uh, Ellen and I work at the E level and maybe there's an even uh, higher level of complexity here, or at least it can appear this way. Um, but I, I do think um, citizens and we should not underestimate like the power we have as citizens. So uh, I would think probably you have much more of an ability to influence than the one uh, or two um, that, that is reflected this and, and it may not be indeed in a direct contact or it may be, but it can also just be, you know, through, through sh showing up, showing, and also by the, by the choices you make every day. Um, so I would say in general, we tend to underestimate, I think the, the power consumers can have, uh, because even if those processes are quite complex and technical, sometimes the role of the public pressure is, is key in, in making things change. So. Um, I would say maybe this is a bit underestimated. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that comment also. Yes, and we will get to um, the consumer level tips later on also. We will also shortly address again the, the point you raised, Klaus, your view uh, as a politician and the possibilities citizens actually do have reaching out to politicians. Now, what I would like to do yes, yeah, so first of all, maybe I wanted to kick it off um, and just... Um, I, of course, also like had a 
thought about how do we actually feel as the ocean now making change um, and how do we actually define making change like what is change actually that is a whole a new topic of course and um, I just wanted to maybe briefly uh, add my point of view before we get into the questions for the panelists. Um, yeah, so we uh, started our campaign Microplastics and Cosmetics and Cleaning Products at the end of 2018. So we've been running it for quite a while and we, we, we absolutely do face this question of how can we actually make change? What do we actually see as making change? So does change mean that as soon as we get into the dialogue, which we are in with, uh, with uh, for example, this decision makers in politics, is this already like uh, a slow path, a low, slow, like a, a little step into the right direction? Um, so in that sense, I would say, yes, we do make change, but it's very subtle because we have not reached our goal yet. So of course we have come across phases where we felt also frustrated when you see like you're working towards a legal ban of something where, where you know this is harmful for humans and the environment and then you know okay this ban has, should have been introduced years ago it's still not there and now it's going to be moved to the eu level so now we just of course didn't give up and say okay this is the end of our campaign we moved it to the eu level so now we're working on the eu level we still have this long breath um so you do kind of build some tenacity. So if someone asked me what is what is needed to accelerate change or to make change, um, I would say, yeah, you do need tenacity. You really do need a long breath. That would be my answer. And you do need faith also into the goal and um, knowing that it, it's possible to reach it. So on a society level, and um, this is the last thing I want to say, um, there I would say, to accelerate change, really, we do need businesses to truly engage into a green with a green economy and not just say it, but really, really like challenge the status quo and also be open for systematic change. And it is very, it's very high time. And I'm just talking high level sustainability. Um, and yeah, so this is my point of view, speaking of ocean now. And so the first question to our panelists, I would like to start with you, Klaus. Yeah, as a politician, you're used to working with various stakeholders. Um, so, of course, complex relationships, different kinds of interest from various sides. Um, so what is your impression? And this kind of goes with what you commented earlier also. How can citizens or groups of engaged citizens actually influence politics? And And the second question is, it kind of goes with it. How would you as a politician like citizens to engage with politics? Well, thank you for the questions. Um, I had to think about it because and maybe I, it's better that I start with a negative experience because I can describe uh, what you don't, what's not a good way to deal with, uh, with problems or with topics. Um, 14 years ago, in, in uh, a village in my district, in uh, uh, Pankow uh, of Berlin, uh, a mosque was planned. And uh, the neighborhood was upset. And uh, in the Heinersdorf is the village, a part of Berlin, uh, lived in, at these times 6,000 people. And uh, we got uh, sometimes 8,000 people on the street demonstrating against this mosque. And uh, we, as uh, I wasn't a member of the Bundestag, I was a member of a municipality parliament, uh, a parliament, uh, a Versammlung in Germany. And um, we had to have uh, protection by the police because uh, people threatened us uh, uh, and wanted us to stop the mosque. And this is really a negative campaign. And uh, it was really, a situation that was frightening for me and I had to make the decision to stay or to stand and uh, uh, for the religious freedom and uh, for our constitution or, and, and um, uh, yeah, risk a lot. And uh, uh, it was interesting what happened in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the policy uh, uh, with my colleagues, uh, all uh, no professionals, uh, uh, you are not a, a, a professional politician on, on the municipality level. And uh, there was a division. Sometimes people said, oh, uh, this pressure we have 
to deal with it. Uh, we have to uh, have to uh, cancel the mosque, and uh, I said, uh, and the majority of uh, people in the municipality parliament said, no, we, we don't, we can't. Uh, there is no uh, possibility to deal with. Uh, uh, human rights and with our constitution and uh, the mosque has to be built and uh, in, in the end we got a majority and uh, this worked and what have i learned about it it's not the power of, of people and threatening politicians it, it's the power of, of argument what uh, you have to use when you have a good goal and uh, this is it is important to to find in the dialogue with the politicians something like a, a common ground protecting the earth protecting the environment is is a common ground and so this is, is, a, is a, it's, it's a positive thinking it's not negative it's, it's positive and uh, uh, the second thing that uh, is important uh, is uh, is to trust the power of arguments to trust the power of arguments and but for this is very important that the politician leaves his bubble it is very important, in, uh, and uh, I have a small office in Prenzlauer Berg, and uh, in normal times without COVID-19, you can meet me where you can, uh, we can fix the date, and then we sit on the table and discuss uh, something. And the most important thing is that you go to the politician and have a debate and have good arguments, and uh, it's necessary that uh, my colleagues, and I try it, uh, that they hear and think about are the people right or are they wrong? So this is uh, the most important thing. And then it is uh, the, the, the networking is very uh, uh, important. If you have a goal, uh, maybe tenant protection or, uh, uh, in the, or uh, climate protection or uh, circular economy, as uh, we have here, it's, it's very important when you want to uh, reach your goals. Uh, and you, you, it's important that you talk with others maybe the, the, the unions, the companies, the municipality level, and that you are, have uh, uh, some front runners uh, acting and arguing with, with, uh, with you and to, to go forward. And for me, it's very important when I, when, I, when I act as a politician, that I say to my colleagues, and I need always the colleagues because poly, poly, uh, in, the poly, um, in the Bundestag you have to have a majority. If you have to have a majority in your in your in your caucus, you have to have a majority in your uh, uh, in the Bundestag. It's very important that you say to the people, "Hey, it's not only this organization. The union thing it's positive. The other thing it's positive, and let us deal with it." And the, the next important question is. Who is responsible? You can decide, and uh, which political level is important. So we have something we decide on the, on the uh, level in the Bundestag. Our, some other questions are decided on the European level, or on the municipality level, or on the level of the, the Bundesstaat. And so it's, it's always important to, to to know what happens. The regulation, the other the things, uh, uh, the the, the uh, way things are moving. And uh, so for me, uh, it's, it's always a process of learning and a process of dialogue and uh, the last sentence it's, it's, it's very important to be polite if you want to to reach your goal to to my colleagues be polite be polite and have good arguments this is the most important and, and don't don't threaten the colleagues and i think you, you don't do it because and, and you won't do it but i think this negative example was uh, uh, necessary to describe mm -hmm. what what's not uh, logic and not good to do. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, so arguments, uh, uh, have a good argument, networking, um, being polite. Uh, and uh, that, that. thank you so much for that input. Um, and yeah, so um, it's uh, that's it's really good to have this this view also from from a politician. And we haven't had this before, actually. And uh, so moving on to to the, the level of um, the legal kind of uh, view of citizens' rights. Uh, this is a question for you, Elen. Um, you're a lawyer, and uh, so you literally uh, view and evaluate the rights of citizens with regards to environmental protection. Um, so Client Earth, so, so it says on its website, uses the law to create powerful change and a future where people and planet thrive together. So in your eyes, um, what is needed to accelerate change? Uh, 
And what are the biggest obstacles? Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I can see in the chat that a lot of people have disillusion. Um, I can relate to that a lot. Um, it's very difficult uh, to to feel power powerful when you know there's all these things going on, um, especially these days. <laughs> we can see what is essential and what is not. Um, to answer your question, Mikey, I would say uh, that there are two levels to my response. Um, there is a first level, which is a personal level, because um, I think collaboration is needed to acceler accelerate change. And collaboration happens, you know, in the NGO world, in the NGO world uh, at EU level, uh, but it also happens, you know, at community level when people organize projects in their municipality. And I think this is key. Uh, to change things. It can be very small, you know, like help your neighbors or something, but I think this is really much needed. And I hope this collaboration can also be horizontal and, and you know, uh, be um, not only among like-minded people, but be across sectors. And I would love to have more companies joining us and, you know, us being more open sometimes to other arguments. And I think this is very important. Um, the second level is uh, more of a high level slash legal perspective because as a as a lawyer at at Clean Earth, um, I working I'm working with the law, so I have I have a bit of hope in that regard. So what is uh, very important, I think, in this regard is to have ambitious and and fit for purpose legislation, which is not always the case. Um, this is also having accessible. Um, legal frameworks um, so that you know it is transparent and people can understand uh, what is going on and they also can keep their policymakers accountable when they don't respect it. Um, so implementation is also an issue. Not all the governments and the municipalities have the same capacities and the same resources to apply the law. So then if you, ha if you even if you have a super good um, legal framework, it may not be implemented uh, because people um, or governments don't have the means to implement it. Um, and then a last thing that is very important to my organization and I think to, to NGOs in general is, is the meaningful stakeholder participation. So the ability of citizens to be aware of environmental decision making and be able to participate. And this is something that is very much lacking today. Um, I will talk about the European level, but I think this is also true in the member states. So for example, at the European level, NGOs still do not have the right to access justice. So we have to go through the national courts before reaching the EU courts, which means that we cannot uh, challenge um, some acts made by the institutions directly. And this is a big issue uh, when you have, in my field, which is chemicals, um, when you have people exposed to dangerous chemicals and you cannot directly uh, challenge this in front of the courts. Um, so this is only one side of the coin, you know, like the law and, 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 and the courts, but it's an important one. When there are massive uh, rights violations, this is very important. And today in the 21st century, uh, not, have, not being able to access the courts uh, in Europe, it's, it's a problem. Um, so, yeah, I would uh, finish on that, Mike. I'm happy to, to answer any, any specific question if needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. That's really, really valuable input also collaboration, a legal framework, and the way also possibilities to, of course, participate, because how can you actually reach a uh, change if only part of the population is able to access and participate? Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much, Eden, for that uh, insight. And um, of course, everyone, uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to send them to Cheryl also. In the meanwhile, I know, unfortunately, we need to move on. Uh, I, I could just stay with every one of you. and <laughs> But we have now Justine also, and, um, and also, um, um, I would like to ask Justine. Uh, yeah, Justine, you have a you have a very rich experience also in campaigning over years, and uh, I wanted to ask you. So, what kind of successful story have you experienced? Because you've you've uh, been worked with, with various NGOs, also Greenpeace, uh, Friday, and um, what was playing this this the most key role in this successful experience of making change? Thank you, Michael. Um 
Um, I would maybe go with an example that is quite recent, um, so it's still a bit fresh in my head. Um, that is the um, EU legislation on single-use plastics uh, that was adopted um, in 2019 and basically bans a number of single-use plastic items and, and then puts uh, in place another, um, yeah, um, a few other measures to really try to reduce the the consumption of single-use plastic and the pollution uh, links to those plastics. And I think looking back at how the process uh, went also at the EU level and the adoption of this, this law, um, one key element was very much the, the strong support from the, the citizens in general for action to be taken on plastic pollution. And the support came from the fact that NGOs on the ground were active for years, building awareness raising, building... Um, and, and showing the evidence, like just by being in the environment, showing what they had to face. And also it, it became, I think, something most citizens could relate to because we've all seen it, we've all been impacted by it to a certain extent. And then it really built this kind of strong um, support from, from citizens overall. And it really kind of gave also... Um, space for ambition at the political level um, and in that file there was also a lot of willingness from key decision makers to make um, the legislation adopted etc and that was also key um, so you definitely need uh, some champions to really get a strong legislation be it i think at the local the national or the eu level you need someone that really is happy to put its full uh, responsibility and its full uh, work into into such a a legislation. So I think that was really important. Um, another thing what was actually the, the collaboration between NGOs at different levels. I think this is key in general in EU decision making and it was quite successful on on this legislation. Um, I see in the, in the comments that there's very little cooperation between NGOs. M my experience is completely different having worked in Brussels. Brussels is often a space where NGOs work together because there's so many decision makers to address. Uh, that if we don't do that, we, there, there's no way. So we're much stronger. We can bring different expertise together. So actually, my experience working in, in NGOs in Brussels has been always very collaborative. And then it's good to collaborate in Brussels, but EU decision making is not just made in Brussels. It's linked to all the positions of the member states. Um, so in a way, it's also made in the capital. And sometimes we forget that. Uh, and sometimes even in the national parliaments. Um, and so we collaborated really strongly with members all across uh, Europe that also contacted their governments, etc. So there was really this this interesting mix of may, maybe more technical support at Brussels level, but then also a lot of, of support from the, the more grassroots organization at the national level. And that was really key. And we were all under the same umbrella, under the same movements. Um, that is called breakthrough from plastic and, and that really helps. Um, and the last thing I would like to mention is I think it's really important to show that change is already there and that actually it's feasible and more than feasible, it's already happening. Um, and I think that that really helps because it's, it doesn't seem then so scary in a way to make that step because actually it's already there. Um, and just as an anecdote, when during the, the negotiation on, on the text, we, we had this event where we created a museum of single-use plastics and it was kind of a joyful and, and a way to just say, okay, in 20 years or 30 years back, we would look at this and be like, you know, th this was didn't make sense and, and it belonged to the past. And we almost, you know, and we showed that it was already belonging to the past and that the solutions were already there. So I think finding a way to also for people to relate to an issue is, is key. And I think maybe that's why on plastic pollution, things have moved quite quickly and maybe on other issues like, you know, microplastic or even air pollution, it's so much harder to just see it with your eyes uh, that maybe sometimes it's harder to relate. So um, I think, yeah, making sure um, people can relate to a topic and then be a bit inventive and be bold um, and has worked quite well. It can work quite well in the past, but I will just finish on one thing to reiterate that indeed we secured this directive, this EU legislation, but now it's implementation phase and it's even more important because otherwise nothing really happens and no change on the ground. So I will completely uh, second what, uh, what Ellen says about the importance of implementation of, of laws then. 
Oh, thank you so much, Justine. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, the implementation part is really big. I've just learned that also. And, uh, um, yeah, so what you said was really inspiring also. I can see um, you, you're saying Brussels is a melting pot of collaboration um, between NGOs, and that is really important. And um, it's also really good to hear your point on um, yeah, and, and really seeing that change is here. I mean, change is already, it's happening and we're already on it. And we like, we just keep on walk, walking the path. It's, uh, and um, yeah, there's moments of being impatient, et cetera. And then what can help is of course, collaborate and find people. That's why we're also doing what we're doing because life really feels different when you do collaborate, when you get together and you feel like, okay, together we're doing something, we're transforming uh, our energy into action. And um, anyways, so I don't want to talk too much because time is flying. And um, so I have lastly a few more questions before we get into the Q&A because there were so many comments. Of course, I want to take enough time for the Q&A. And um, so for all of our participants, uh, sorry, for our panelists, um, I have another two questions, actually. The first one is quite a, quite a high level one. And um, the second one is more a little bit more concrete, but both are a little philosophical, I would say. Um, so imagine you were a leader of a country and you could change something. So I don't want to say you're a dictator and you could just say, okay, from now on, it's going to be X, Y, Z and nothing else. But, you know, just imagine you have the power to really change something. It can be anything, anything. What would it be? And this would be relatively brief. Unfortunately, we can't go into a, a long story, but from each of you, I would be really curious to hear your thoughts. Justine, uh, Elaine, and Klaus, um, you can, uh, you can be, it, it can be like a, a wild ideas, you know, don't hold back. I can, um, can start, but I don't have like something that I would, uh, change, but I think I would um, maybe find a way for people or also for young people to see maybe sometimes the complexity of things and also how like having a holistic approach, because I feel sometimes what is missing is that we're trying to change one piece in silo and then looking at the impact on something else. And then at the end of the day, we created another issue. Um, so I think being able to see the complexity of, of things and, and trying to have this holistic approach would be great and would help in many ways fixing um, many of the issues we're, we're having. So that would be that would be my um, aspect of life is, is good as well in the chat for sure. Sounds good. Thank you. Well, I, you can I will go next. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I, I love the I love the love suggestion. <laughs> we need more love, that's for sure. Um, I think I would empower people much more at their level because I think we do a lot of great things uh, when it's uh, concrete at our level, and we can see the direct impact or more of a direct impact. So, so yeah, I would I would make it le less of a centralized society, but. Um, give more powers to communities to deal with their own business and and deal with those business as they feel fits, given their traditions. They, you know, Aboriginal communities use to work like that. And um, I think it worked for, for quite some years. Um, so this is unfortunately not possible, I guess, because we're such a huge society now. But uh, that would be a dream if I, if I were to be a leader. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting question. I would um, talk with the people about uh, planetary boundaries and um, that uh, it is necessary uh, not to have to experience have a, a big experience with the planetary boundaries and that we have to respect them. So uh, that there is no security without uh, saving our environment and uh, that this question uh, with topic has to be a, a consensus for all politicians. So something like uh, 
yeah, as I said, a common ground uh, and uh, that everybody agrees in this and uh, this would help a lot. So we there would, wouldn't be a, a political debate about uh, if a change is necessary or not, only a debate about what is the best way to uh, organize the change. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Klaus. Yeah, I understand. Absolutely. Thank you for your for your voices here, comments here. Um, the next question, what is the mindset people need to change society? If you pick three words, what will, would those words be? Okay, I'm starting again then. <laughs> um, I would say trust in yourself and in others. Um, being bold, you don't don't restrain yourself. Um, and um, the last one maybe would be interconnectedness, because I think if we all have a better sense of how everything is connected, I think that that would help as well um, for change. Thanks, Justine. Klaus or Elen, you can pick whoever grabs the microphone first. Okay. It's, it's not, right? Maybe I, I start with, with one, one, one topic, because my father was a barrier keeper, maybe as you know, in Germany, Schrankenwerter worked uh, uh, for the railway. Uh, it was uh, Deutsche Bundesbahn uh, 20, uh, 40 years ago. And uh, they constructed then tunnels and bridges, and he lost his job. But and, and this job was very important for him. So uh, one thing is very important to have respect for the people who have to deal with change and give an alternate alternative. Respect, res respect for for the people who have to deal with change. Because, as I said, change is necessary. I think. Is it? Thank you, Klaus. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, I can already see people also sharing their thoughts in the chat. Feel free to share your thoughts, of course. Um, anything you would like, you you think that's needed in society. And it's really good to inspire each other, um, of course. Um, great. So this was uh, our discussion round. So now it's becoming interactive again. Um, and uh, before we move into the Q&A, uh, first a little note, uh, because we're running a little behind, this session will probably go, uh, will be like approximately 10 minutes past seven. I hope this works. Uh, sorry, past eight uh, for everyone. Before we do the Q&A, um, this will be a chair's end. What we would like to share with you is just a few tips because we do know, yes, we're looking at the high level change and impact, having impact today, but of course you can make change as a consumer as well. And we just wanted to show a few uh, tips. And this is um, Ola's part, Ola, uh, you can, you have the floor. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, you are also welcome to um, write any tips you have uh, to write in the chat about how you, what do you do in your daily life, life to um, be a little bit more sustainable. Um, and we, um, as Ocean Now, um, have some tips for you, what you could do. Um, so first, I'm putting it now into the chat. Um, just a second. Um, it would be, for example, um, signing our petition. That's probably um, a lot of you already done. Yeah, the other petition is um, a, by, a petition by Beat the Microbit, which is our partner. It's about banning microplastics in cosmetics on the EU level. Um, you can also uh, watch our um, YouTube video, um, which is from our past events about how to examine products with different apps and check if they have uh, microplastics and toxic um, substances inside in the ingredients. Um, then we also have a, a video about uh, making your own cosmetics, which is um, a video from our last um, event series that we did online. And you can also um, download the recipe. Uh, we have a PDF for you. And the last thing, um, or the thing before the last one, is um, zero waste ideas 
uh, from our um, zero waste workshops in May 2020. You can also download um, this as a PDF. Micah is copying it to the chat now. And um, if you are also interested um, in participating in our next um, interactive um, and interactive action, um, it's going to happen uh, very soon. It will be very easy and exciting. Um, if you would like to get to know um, more information about it, please uh, paste your um, or write your email address in the chat and I will send you the details what you could do uh, and how to join us on this. And of course, um, you can later decide after reading uh, the email I would send you if you actually would like to participate. But what I can say, it will be very, very uh, exciting and I'm looking forward to it. So whoever wants to join, just please um, paste the email to the chat. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, yeah, this was a little, uh, a lot of information, but we didn't want to make, <laughs> miss the chance to send, send you a few options of how to take action. And on this note, I would also like to just, before we do the Q&A in a minute, um, say that our next event will actually be on the focus of uh, consumer influence or um, the philosophy and psychology of zero waste also. So it's going to be on the 4th of March. So we will get to, of course, also like how do you actually challenge your comfort zone and uh, how can you actually make change in your, whole, in your own daily life? Like what kind of ideas are there? Okay, so um, now we have, we do have uh, exactly 20 minutes for our q and I'm glad because we, of course, want to also get your questions on board for our panelists. I'm sure maybe there are a few. I saw quite a bit of interaction in the chat. And uh, yeah, Ch uh, Cheryl, have you, have you received some? Uh, yes, I did receive some questions. So first of all, thank you for uh, the interaction and all your comments here during uh, this online event. And I'm just gonna uh, quickly start with the first uh, question we had. So um, first question is, Klaus said that we should be nice to politicians, but none of the revolutions were nice, as you can say so. So the question is, if we want to reach our agenda, how do you um, find a balance between being nice and being not too aggressive? Who wants to start? Uh, interesting question. Um, I think the Fridays for Future movement, they, they found a, a good compromise between um, these two ways of acting. And um, the thing that was very important they did was um, to act together as scientists for future. And uh, this was very important uh, for, uh, for their success. And uh, really, they had a lot of success. I, I negotiated the, the German climate protection law uh, two years ago for, for my caucus. And uh, it was really a big problem with our coalition partner to, to deal with it. And, and uh, the power from, uh, from Fridays for Future and uh, the power of uh, scientists for future and very important, important uh, the power of some unions uh, and uh, some uh, um, some companies who were front runner for climate protection helped, and uh, the EU influence helped too because uh, the European Union, union and uh, the, the climate targets from the European Union and uh, the Paris Agreement again. So so it's 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 always a, a mixture, and, and sometimes you have have uh, there's a good timing for change. This was 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 really good. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a good example, and I hope uh, that we get a, a, a good time for uh, these uh, evolutions uh, in the next uh, years too, because it's necessary. Uh, thank you for your answer. Um, so, do the other two maybe you want to say something to that as well? Yeah, I think there's many ways to be creative and um, yeah, and find ways to, to show um, what you want and without going into you know disrespect or violence and and I think there's there's a lot of things that have also happen in terms of um, singing representations like uh, also the, the feminist movement has, has quite amazing demonstration 
um, with just artistic, um, artistic demonstration, etc., that are also very powerful. I do think there's there's a power in numbers and in visual, like in, in having very visual activities. Um, I think that they are quite powerful. Uh, and also because we live in a world of images and videos, etc., I think there's definitely a power there. Um, but I do trust in the you know creativity of, of citizens and you know uh, to to make those uh, possibly um, they can be still very serious because sometimes we talk about very serious topic, uh, but still being very respectful or, or you know without violence, I would say. Yeah, all right. Okay, so um, thank you for your answer as well. Um, at this moment, I would say then I would just continue with the second question then. Um, so the other question was, how can you influence a political scene in a country where you live, but where you live as a foreigner, for example? I mean, I think, yeah, maybe close, you have more of a view on this. <laughs> I don't ask people when they come to me if I have a German passport or not, so, but it's, it's maybe it's, uh, it's my personal perspective. Maybe some other guys more or less look if uh, this is a potential uh, voter for them. I don't do it. So I'm not the right uh, man to ask this question. So, uh, and I think argument is, uh, doesn't depend on uh, if you are a citizen of a state or not. So, uh, uh, but I think sometimes maybe it, it, uh, my colleagues think uh, it's not right. But yeah, I think we have a way around. Yeah, I think so too. It doesn't really matter if you live, I don't know, if you live here or in Belgium or somewhere else. I mean, we all have the same interests and we all have the same aims. So I think it doesn't really matter where you live or where you're from. It's just uh, that we all come together and try to reach our goal. Yeah, so thank you for... There's one interesting event. This is, this is maybe this is important because on the climate conferences, we have uh, some organizations and uh, there's a meeting with uh, people from uh, the global south, and we discuss with them how we deal with the climate change. And uh, they have sometimes where the situation is really um, uh, threatening for their lives. Uh, some of the islands, islands in the Pacific, and and this dialogue is is very important and. Uh, and uh, it helps to argue in, in the German parliament. But the problem is they only talk with a politician who deals with climate change and the, 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 climate, uh, 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 the climate crisis. And uh, the people uh, who think the climate crisis doesn't exist, they don't go uh, to these meetings. So, uh, but, but for me, this was very important to talk with the people from other countries and uh, they uh, showed me what happened in their country. And it was a good argument for me, uh, for the argumentation in my caucus and in the, in the parliament. Uh, yes, I guess it does make a difference uh, at some point if you live in the global north or in the global south. So, yeah, there are definitely differences, but still it's not really that important where you live or like where you come from. Yeah. Okay, so um, I see that there are still questions coming in. So the next question would be, which level of course has client earth had the most success in changing policy? Is it local? Is it state? Uh, is it international? So I guess this question is for Elen, I guess. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so, um, if you don't know, um, Client Earth is um, is originally based in London, um, but we have offices in Brussels, Madrid, uh, Berlin, Warsaw, and we just opened a, an office in in uh, Shanghai, in China. So we have um, different kind of experience in litigation. Um, I cannot really talk much about. Um, experience in the states where I have not practiced. Um, I'm indeed based in Brussels, so our, our focus is mainly on the EU Court of Justice. 
even if we have, of course, local contacts um, with the national courts, because sometimes we need to go, you know, until the top na top national courts to be then able to go to the EU courts. So this is part of our job. But from my experience at EU court level, we've had quite uh, some success. Uh, so we've never intervened, as I told you, as an NGO, but we've intervened um, uh, by the sides of, of, of claimants or defendants. Um, so sometimes member states, sometimes the commission, sometimes the European parliament. Um, so you can find a lot of cases where we have been very active. Um, sometimes, of course, that's, that's, the, that's the risk of litigation you lose. But I have to say we've been, um, each time we've involved ourselves on a case, we've done, you know, as much as we could to, to bring the best arguments. And, and, and we've had, according to me, quite some success um, in that regard. But of course, action at EU level is not the same as uh, action in the member states' courts because you have then the national law applying. So this is completely different processes. Uh, and, and I have not been personally involved in that. Um, yeah, there is a question in the chat, so maybe I should respond to it. How do you select cases to get involved with? Um, I think the level of importance, depending on the file we're working in, is is uh, is the factor that we will be uh, looking at. So, for example, I am in the chemicals team, so we will be looking at the you know the worst chemicals being handled. Or, you know, if there is a, a big a media campaign or push on a chemical we will be focusing on, and if there is a bad decision from from an EU institution, then we will go for this kind of cases, um, usually. But it really depends. And uh, Client Earth has many teams in it, uh, you know, some working on energy, some working on environmental democracy, chemicals, um, carbon, I mean, um, a lot of different topics, so we all try to, to focus on what is the most important at a certain time and knowing that we can't handle everything. So sometimes we have to make a choice and it's, it's not always the best choice, but we try our best. I hope this answers the question. I think it does. Uh, well, uh, thank you first of all for that. Uh, that was very interesting to just get an insight of Client Earth. And, um, I will just go and continue directly with the next question. Um, I have to find it. Excuse me, just one second. For some reason, my chat window just popped up, just really big. So, okay, all right, okay. So, um, how do policymakers understand the science behind issues like harmful chemicals or microplastics? So are the resources sufficient for effective legislation and policy formation, or is there still need for change? Um, I don't know. Um, let's try. Um, so often there's enough information, scientific information, um, for sure, like for sure. I think um, microplastic is a topic where we still there is still a lot of research done, but there's there's a lot of research already on on the environmental impact and and more and more on the health impact. I think what is key then um, is how you manage to present that to the decision makers as well, because um, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist and, and obviously there's a limit to what you can easily understand. And some of those topics can be very complex. So I think there's, um, there's a need to be able to translate that into fairly um, easy communication for people that may not be chemists or, or scientists. And that's partly what the NGOs also try to do. And also some um, some organizations that are really uh, really known for for trying to communicate around science and they're very helpful in, in the political process um, so I think you know the science is there it's it's often how you you bring it and and then there may be gaps uh, in the science um, but then you, we also have you know the precautionary principle then that, that comes in and and that says that you cannot just delay action uh, on, on the fact that you may uh, miss some information. Like, and, and on many topics, we have more than enough information that to justify action. Um, but indeed, the, the question of how, how to translate sometimes complex scientific information into 
something that can be easily understood by everyone um, is, is definitely um, a job in itself. Yeah, thank you for your uh, for your answer, first of all. Um, so maybe Klaus, do you maybe want to add something to that? Um, we have always in parliaments different topics we deal with, and I, I don't deal with microplastic with a, a, a colleague of mine who deals with it. And um, I think uh, from my perspective, uh, there is enough information about the alternative and the risks and the precautionary principle, as it was mentioned, uh, is, is right. And uh, I, I think in the moment we have a debate, who has to regulate? Is it on the EU level or is it on the federal state level? And can Germany be a front runner and uh, 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 be faster than the European level? And uh, I think this is, is the a big problem of, of, of yeah, the, the, the time, uh, the time to act, uh, the time people think we have to act, and uh, the, uh, the, the thing how urgent it is, uh, is to solve a problem. And I think there are some similarities with the, the climate uh, 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 question, the climate crisis. Uh, every information was available 20 years ago, but we didn't act because the threat was not so, yeah, yeah, what, what can we say? The, the lobbyists, they, they said there is no threat and uh, people didn't recognize it. And I think there are some parallels. And uh, uh, in, in the, on this topic, I think we need more courage and uh, to have clear goals, uh, as in the climate uh, question, zero fossil CO2 emissions and uh, uh, here zero microplastic. And uh, I think that this uh, will help. This is my, my perspective, but uh, as I mentioned, I'm not uh, uh, the Berichterstatter, as we say in, in, in Germany, and nearly not an expert. Yeah, I see. Okay, thank you for that. Um, first of all, yeah, I think it's very complicated, especially if you think about that, um, you want to change something on national level, but then you also have to um, think about if this is an if this goes along with uh, EU regulations, so yeah, I, I understand it. It's also um, um, depending on other other factors as well. So, ah, okay, I can I can see another question right here. Um, so the question is, what lessons can Klaus share for other countries and policymakers that are further behind on the path to building a green economy? It's a tough one, I can see it. <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, it is really so that, that um, Germany, we learn from, from other countries. So um, uh, in, in Germany, everybody thinks we are the front runner, we are the best, and um, all business. And um, we were the best. We started uh, 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 the Renewable Energy with the Renewable Energy Act. This was really our front runners for the, for the world. But the regulation, the climate protection uh, law, uh, we adopted from the United Kingdom, and uh, I think they, they implemented it 15 years ago. So, uh, so for me, I always uh, um, try to make a research and, and, and look at what, what uh, 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 works in Sweden, mainly uh, uh, district heating, or what is in, in Switzerland, uh, um, uh, transportation with uh, fuel cell trucks, and uh, I think the, 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 we need a, a communication with the front runners and organize the front runners and tell the stories that it's possible, change is possible. And uh, uh, it's very important for me, and, and we have in, in a, a small committee in my, in my caucus, we deal with climate protection things, and, and I, I invite always people from other countries and to tell me what we are doing, Switzerland, solar revolution. They are front runner for all Europe, and uh, the European Union adopted their regulation for uh, community solar. So this is the way I deal with it, and uh, uh, not to think uh, and, uh, and to every day to to think something. There is some interesting innovation where there will be in the world, and to communicate and uh, say to people that is possible. This is the way I deal with it, with it, and uh, something 
about regulation in Germany, we have a problem. We have always these coalition agreements, and uh, and every four year we have a change in government, and uh, there's a new uh, uh, coalition contract uh, negotiated, and we have the way the, the people in Denmark deal with it in climate protection. And they they have coalition agreements too, but uh, minority governments and. The people without the extremists, right-wing extremists, uh, uh, they got together and they make fix a deal for 10 years, a goal for climate protection and for renewables and for some amber environmental laws. And this is a, a good way to deal with with, uh, with problems and to, to implement yeah, a, a, a long goal policy. So I try to learn uh, techniques and uh, the way to deal with problems. And I think Germany can learn a lot from other uh, uh, countries. Uh, and in the moment, I, I, I'm i really happy that uh, Franz Timmermans is uh, in the EU Commission and try to push climate protection forward. Uh, without him, uh, <laughs> it would be a disaster, I think. So it's it's a way to to use the opportunities and because uh, the windows uh, 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 the, the windows of opportunity yeah we are closing so we don't have so much time yeah i hope i answered the question this is very spontaneous yeah i really like your answers so thank you a lot and uh, thanks to the other panelists as well for their answers um i think uh, we are good in time and i guess I'm going to close this Q&A right now, and I will hand it over to Michael right now. So thank you, all, all of you, for your questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cheryl, and thanks uh, to the panelists and, and to the audience for all your questions. Really inspiring. And uh, yeah, because we're kind of coming to the end slowly, the last thing I would ask, I would like to ask our panelists, um, is what is it what would you like to give people to take away a a tip a a sentence a few words um what would you like to give them um on the on the on the same topic like um on making change this is just something to the audience a little a little uh word Uh, keep moving forwards. That's the only way. Um, but don't lose yourself in the process. So take care of yourself as well. I think the most important thing is that you recognize that change is possible. And if it's, if it's not possible, you're, you can't be optimistic and then You've got a, yeah, a trauma and this is not good. You have, you have to be realistic and optimistic and change has to be done. And uh, this is uh, my, my last words for today. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It was a pleasure to be here and, and participate to this conversation. I hope there will be many others. Um, well, I would I would wish for everyone to remain very positive and be creative and uh, and yeah, we can we can all contribute to to make this world a better place and a more happy place as well. So um, yeah, so yeah, thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so thanks for, to everyone also who joined. This was a very inspiring, uh, a, a very uh, like it felt pretty short actually. Uh, for this big kind of topic, but we we uh, we hope we could make a start and I get to for for like an inspiring uh, discussion. We can continue ourselves at home with friends and family. And um, I'm sure we'll have another event on this topic again, because it's a really, it's such an important one. Um, really nice to, to have you here on board. And um, uh, my last words would be, oh yeah, if you like what you see, um, we're an NGO and we live off donations. So I'm just putting a little link here in the chat, lastly. And um, also we'll have uh, once more, uh, we'll have our next event on the 4th of March um, on, on the philosophy and psychology of zero waste. And actually this is this is actually a good, good point to continue this. So really looking at your own, our own, um, our comfort zone, because the comfort zone really does play a huge role in making change as well on a daily, in a daily life. Great. I hope um, everybody had a nice session and um, I wish you a nice rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye, everyone. All the best.